nothing ever filled the gap for me of that interactivity that that pet created. And I needed to have that forever after that. This is the Techsploder podcast, conversations with tech professionals about being human in a binary world. Episode 22, Jay Adelson. Techsploder is made possible by the financial support of our patrons like Thomas Hillman. If you like what you hear, head on over to patreon.com slash Jason Howell to support the show directly. And thank you for making independent podcasting possible. Hello and welcome back to the Textbloder podcast. I'm your host Jason Howell and took a little bit of a, a little bit of a breather break. For those of you who weren't aware, my apologies for not doing an effective job of communicating it, but I had to kind of move the podcast back to a less constant release schedule. I can't let go of this show, though, because I just love it. I have these wonderful conversations with people who I admire, who I respect. And so I'd say expect an episode every month-ish. Stay subscribed. You'll see them. And as I can kind of increase that over time, I will because I want to kind of get back to the regular um, kind of cadence of the show. Anyways, that's a little bit of housekeeping right off the top. I just want to apologize uh, straight up. But... Let's talk about today's guest because I'm super thrilled to welcome Jay Adelson. And actually, previous guest and a big time friend of mine, Ron Richards, uh, works closely with Jay Adelson. And he's been saying, Ron's been saying, you got to get Jay on this show. He would be wonderful. And I have to admit, it was a wonderful conversation. Jay Adelson is a renowned American internet entrepreneur, technology visionary. He co-founded Equinix, (laughs) so really powered a lot of the early internet, a global leader in data center and interconnection services, later became a pivotal figure in the Web 2.0 movement as co-founder and CEO of Dig, also Revision 3. So if you caught any of the shows on Revision 3, you know the work of Jay. Named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People in 2008, Adelson has continued to shape the tech landscape through ventures like Simple Geo and Opsmatic. Currently, he serves as co-founder of Scorbit, a company devoted to interconnecting the history of pinball machines to the internet and each other, along with Ron Richards. This was an excellent conversation. Absolutely had a blast. So let's get right to it. Here's Jay Adelson. All right, Jay Adelson, it is a pleasure and a privilege to get the chance to sit down with you. Thank you so much for hopping on Texploder Podcast with me today. Hey, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. I'm honored. Uh, well, I am honored, and I have to say, like our mutual friend Ron Richards, who has also been on the podcast before, I can't tell you how many conversations I've gotten into with Ron over the years. We do the Android Faithful podcast together, where your name has come up, where your mutual project slash business Scorbit has come up, and he just ha- always has nothing but wonderful things to say about you. So when I when I you know brought him onto the podcast and have been talking to him about kind of what it's all about he's like oh dude you need to get jay adelson on so (laughs) that's funny i mean you know ron ron likes to sometimes say that he's not the as much the tech guy and that he's more of you know business or marketing the reality is he's he's as nerdy as i am at the core we both love the same kinds of things and you know i i i he'll do something like one time i saw him wearing a t-shirt that was the Karataka game. Ah, oh, I've seen scroller. that t-shirt. Seen him wear it. Yep. And I was like, oh, you, you and I, like we both uh-huh. know what that is. He goes, yeah. And that's, I mean, how much more techie can you get than that, really? Yeah, that that's a that's a real <laughs> techie, nerdy throwback that I appreciate. <laughs> um, what was the, yeah, what was the system that you you played your uh, on Karateka on? Oh, for Apple sure. Two. Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, it was, it was more than that. I knew, and I don't know how I knew at the time, but I knew about Jordan Mershner. Like I knew about, about, um, Swashbuckler because I had played that game in the past, which was like the first one that he did. Right. And then, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then of course, Prince of Persia. And I remember I even bought, I bought a book on assembly language programming thinking that if I just read the book, I'd, I'd learn how to 
do it. You could do it too. Yeah, it's as you know? easy as that. <laughs> Which might be Meanwhile, this is assembly people. that we're talking well, also, about. I was 11. <laughs> <laughs> so, so give me a, you know, but like 11, 12 years old playing these yeah. games on the Apple. Well, actually, I, by the time that was, I was 12. So I got my Apple II when I was 12 years old. So, so seeing that T-shirt on, and Ron is younger than me. Mm -hmm. Ron and I are about the same age. Yeah. You know, and so it's like, uh huh, like you actually know what that is. Okay. That's pretty <laughs> badass. Oh, man. So, yeah. yeah I've been, uh, uh, he's, he and I share a lot of shared interests. I think the other one that is unusual is in television. We both oh, yeah. loved in a stupid way in television. I, I don't even know, like, how proud I should be of, of talking about that. But, um, very, I mean, you're in the right company to be very proud <laughs> of in television. I never owned an Intellivision, but I definitely had friends who had an Intellivision and yeah, I, I've, I've fond memories. It was that. And then I had another friend that had the Coleco vision, the Coleco vision that everybody had one friend of each. Yes. Right? I had the, Atari, everybody had the Atari. And then when those new yep. consoles came out, there'd always be one friend that would have them. <laughs> and what's interesting yeah. about in television was the same kid who got in television first is the reason I got into computers in the first place. Oh, no kidding. So I don't, everybody must have the sim similar stories because it, particularly if you're my age, because not everybody had a computer. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I was like, I want to say nine, 10. I had this friend, Jeff, who, whose dad was a principal in a local school. And the dad would bring home on the weekends, a Commodore pet. Mm -hmm. So for those of your viewers who may not be familiar, if you Google Commodore pet, you will see this like giant TV looking thing with an attached keyboard on it. <laughs> that didn't have any hard drives back then. So it had like a tape cassette drive that was like connected to it. I mean, yeah, that's it. That's it. It was absolutely enormous. And so for this, for this, for his father, Jerry, to bring this thing home every weekend and cart it in the back of his giant pro his station wagon or whatever he was driving. And then we'd put it on Jeff's desk in his bedroom and there was, <laughs> we would do this every weekend. And all we would do is we would load one game that was called Scott Adams Pirates Adventure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You Absolutely know what that yeah. is. Okay. I'm, I, I, yes, I'm pretty sure. I, I want to pull up the art just to know for sure that I'm thinking of the same thing. I mean, there I was cover art, pirates? but this sort of predates graphics <laughs> it's sort of like a Let go north here. stay yo ho kind of thing okay like you're, you're I'm, i might be thinking room. of i might be thinking of a different but this this appears to be the no, graphic that's 19 no that's 1979 that's okay okay that's not the graphics of the like the game had no right. graphics right 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 prompt. and i remember because i was <laughs> like a dungeons and dragons kid too like i would sit there in front of his computer with him and it, it would say, you're standing inside a London flat. You you see a rug and the windows open, you know, and a rat scurrying across the ground. You can use two word commands like look, examine. Yep. Go north, south, west. You had to like stand on the ledge and say a password and it would like teleport you to this, this island. <sighs> and it was just insane the amount of hours we spent on it and then one day i come to his house and he's got a game console he's got the intellivision and then it became that right mm -hmm. but nothing ever filled the gap for me of that interactivity that that pet created and i needed to have that forever mm. after that mm. Oh, well, talk about a rabbit hole. Yeah, I love that rabbit hole. Um, I So my first computer was a Commodore 64. And I would say that's like peak 
like technology oh, yeah. nerddom for me in my in my childhood. Like you know, so much of everything that came after it, as far as my passion around technology and computers and everything, is because of the Commodore sixty four. I never had the experience with the pet, so I'm actually, I, I love hearing about it because it's one of those obscure technologies that is is obviously so interconnected with the thing that's so important to me, yet kind of out of my reach. I've never had an experience with it. I mean, it was typically a computer that would only be in a school because it really mm. was too big for most people to have at home and it was too expensive. Mm. Also, it took like 20 minutes to load the game. <laughs> you'd have yes. this cassette tape. It's cassette, right? Playing, yeah. <laughs> and then these two stars would appear on the screen that would flash back and forth. And sometimes it wouldn't work. So you'd have to start over. Yeah. So when I'm like... When my kids are our adults now, but when they were like growing up and we'd be in traffic, like in a freeway on the way someplace, and I would seemingly be unfazed and they'd be like, how, how can you just sit here with nothing happening for so long? I'm like, well, <laughs> do you like video games? <laughs> they're like, yes. I would say, well, imagine if you had to wait 20 minutes every time you played a video game for it to start. Oh You've developed God. some pretty good skills for waiting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed. It's nuts. Load runner on the Commodore 64. Oh, you know, loved it. You know, yeah. it's worth waiting for, but um yeah. Yeah, gaming. Gaming was big. It was it was uh, a big part of I don't think I'm the only Gen X to say this, but like it kind of shaped everything. Mm -hmm. It was the gateway to all things tech for me. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can agree with that. I mean, that's, you know, again, that's, that's where my passion uh, really stemmed from with the Commodore 64. I love the, t the, the way you framed that, like anticipation, the waiting, the 20 minutes of waiting for a game there, <laughs> because there's so many, there's so many examples of that, I think in modern tech lifestyle that go counter to that, that need yeah. to wait for, for what's for the gold on the other end of that waiting, right? Like music used to be, you had to go into a record store and you had to be very selective and pick the one thing that you could spend your fifteen dollars on. That's right. And you'd listen to it time and time and time again because you didn't have infinite resources to listen to anything at the spur of the moment. And now, you know, and that's just one example. But now technology has made everything so immediate and so vast. That mm -hmm. certain things have gotten lost in the way. Like twenty minutes to wait for a game seems like a real downside. But I remember at the time that anticipation was so much part of the fun. It was like, oh man, Absolutely. I can't wait for this thing to pop on the screen. You know. Well, and if you were pirating stuff like I was over the not internet, like yeah, I would like find a download site for some obscure stupid game, and it would like download at 300 baud or 1200 baud all night <laughs> yes. long and then like you'd wake up in the morning and like it had like you know hung up on you and, and you'd have to start oh. over and you just got used to this waiting yep mm -hmm. and you know there were other things it's interesting because i've never really made this connection before um so the other thing that i was really into at that time was filmmaking hmm. which sounds weird to put that way um, because you have to remember that that meant a movie camera, mm -hmm. super eight or eight millimeter. Right. And then each film had to be lit. Like, cause you know, you, you couldn't just shoot in regular light, which might sound really strange to anyone who just shoots video on their phone. Like it's nothing, but like you had to light the scene Sometimes you had to use a filter in the camera if you were doing color and, and different things, indoor, tungsten, outdoor. Um, and it was incredibly short. So five minutes max per roll. Mm -hmm. And then there'd only be like usually one place you could drop it off. And then you'd have to wait two weeks for it to come back. And then nine times out of 10, you blew it. So it like would not, <laughs> you wouldn't know be like, until like a month later, or like, you know, <laughs> but like in a similar vein, it made making movies more fun for me because there yeah. was this anticipation 
of waiting to find out what, what was going to happen. And sometimes weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I ended up, when I, when I went to college, I had a real personal crisis of whether or not I wanted to spend my life waiting for computer games to start <laughs> or, sp- or wait for film to be processed because I actually went to school for both of those things for mm. filmmaking and for, and for computers. And, uh, you know, there is something to be said about the magic is par- partly the anticipation. Cause I do think one of the reasons I ended up going more away from filmmaking was because it became almost commoditized in a way. And the magic part of it was like, you know, the practical effects, you know, and that kind of thing mm-hmm. started to become abstracted. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, 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 uh, yeah, I've never really made that, that connection before, but that's interesting. Meanwhile, um, the, the, the practical, the effects that you're talking about moved, ventured further into the technological realm versus the kind of, yeah, like, like you said, the, the practical realm, which is what they were up to a certain point, they became very digital. It just required an, a completely different skill set. It required a higher level of cost and yeah. education. And I mean, it's, totally. yeah. Not, I, not that Super 8 filmmaking was like, you know, it gave you direct access to creating cinematic Hollywood feature films, but that pushes it even further away when, you know, now you have to have a, a team who knows exactly what they're doing in order to, to do it because you can't do it all. Yeah, it's, uh, it is kind of interesting. And now it's coming full circle where people are doing more practical effects mm-hmm. again because they find that it looks a certain way that they can't. Maybe it's uncanny valley problems, you know, whatever. But uh, I've always been fascinated with that kind of stuff, and I'm mm, um, me too. And I'm still, I'm still fascinated by it. I'm. I remember um, when Ron and I worked together at Revision Three years ago. There's a group that still makes a show called Film Riot, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where they like show you how to use After Effects to like make like a lightsaber duel, or whatever. I was hooked on that show. Like, and I, I wasn't supposed to sh- play favorites or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Cause I was like chairman of the board <laughs> or whatever, but, uh, but wow. I mean, I would watch that every, every episode. That's just really cool. Now I can't claim to have any actual filmmaking skills, but <laughs> I'm just fascinated by it. You know, um, I would argue that, that the same is true with computers. I, I never was particularly good at coding. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love I. coding, but I'm not good at it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you you started with a flat row of nothing but numbers with uh, with assembly and machine language. So your roots are strong. Anyone who starts there, man, <laughs> it it's, so you good. can only go up from there. <laughs> like, seriously, you know, any parent will tell you, like, if there isn't a if there isn't a, a small success early in your relationship with something, <laughs> you don't keep doing it. <laughs> and I think that might have been kind of my downfall of coding was like assembly just it doesn't make any sense to me. And then as soon as I like years later got back into it and I was in uh, college and I'd be sitting in a computer lab and you'd be programming in a more English like way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That would be, that was when I was like, Oh, there might be something here for me. But I, but I ended up uh, going ironically graduating with a degree in film Mm-hmm. <laughs> that I never used and then um <laughs> ending up working in tech. So how did Yeah, that- ending up working in tech. But you also worked in in media, so I imagine some of your film film studies, you know, could be put to use there somehow. <laughs> I, I actually wanted to work in the control room as an intern. Okay. Yeah. And the CEO, so at that point I was chairman and we had hired a CEO to run Revision 3 and and he said, no, like, I was like, well, wait, you know, I mean, I founded the company. Can't I, you know, apprentice and learn how to operate, you know, the, the switching board and all that. And he's like, no, you intimidate the interns. <laughs> like, what does that mean? Uh, I intimidate the interns? They don't want to no. mess up. 
they don't want to mess up around you. You're one of the head cheeses. They, uh, I'm not like that, but yeah, I understand yeah. why they may not know that. They might not know that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I never got to play with the, with the tech and I never got to get involved in the production. Um, the closest I got was, um, one of the producers there, David Prager asked me to do a show in 2010 or something like that, 2012. And we shot 79 episodes of like how to start a company kind of stuff called mm -hmm, ask mm -hmm. Jay. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's still up there. And I get like, I get like emails from folks in, in Brazil saying that they've got some venture back startup and they watched my series and they have questions. I'm like, Oh, the show's been out of production for, for <laughs> almost a decade. So good luck with Dude. that. Do any of the uh, the the information that you have there? Do you do you feel? I mean, I would I would guess that it's all still totally relevant at this point. Like, have has starting a company shifted so much in the year twenty twenty four compared to twenty ten? I mean, I guess in some ways it it probably has a lot. But what's your take on that? That's a really good question. I mean, I I honestly think it hasn't changed very much. Um, that some of the, the, the nomenclature and, you know, the lexicon around it has changed a little bit. Um, it's funny because, because, uh, when you raise venture capital, you know, what we used to call a seed round is what I think in 2012, you would have called an a round, you know, like there's these different mm -hmm. names, but I mean, but by and large, the, the rules are basically the same. The investor wants to make a hundred times their investment and they'll tell you that they only need to make 10 to make you less anxious. But the reality is they're not investing unless they imagine in their head, that they're going to make a hundred times, which is extremely unlikely, even if you're successful. Hmm. So already you're not aligned with those guys from the first day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then the, the net of it is, is that, um, the startup, experience. The things that have changed is that nobody comes to the office anymore. That is a big change. You know, work from home culture and some of that wackadoodle work till midnight thing, which was really unhealthy anyway, um, doesn't happen anymore because nobody's, everyone's on Slack for their, for their job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting because uh, while starting the company in many ways is the same execution on your idea is very different. The people that you need, there's fewer people in certain areas. There's more people in other areas. You can outsource so much more, um, particularly for tech companies. Uh, there's a commoditization of certain pieces of the, of the supply chain. There's things like, um, well, your prototype, you know, is a great example. Like you always have to build a prototype and now mm -hmm. AI can build you your prototype. So <laughs> what does that mean? Um, yeah. Well, what quality of prototype is an AI oh, yes. building yeah, by comparison? Yeah. Terrible. Uh, but I had, uh, uh, you know, occasion to, to watch an episode of my old show as it related to, uh, going and pitching a VC because mm -hmm. it had been so long. Cause I, so for your viewers benefit, I had been an entrepreneur for a lot of years. I had started a bunch of companies and then I became a VC for a while. I started my own fund thinking that I would like that. It turned out that while I liked my business partner, we had a really great time doing it together. I really didn't enjoy being a VC. Mm -hmm. um, and I hadn't pitched anyone myself in a very long time. <laughs> and recently I had to do that again. And so I was like, I don't even know where to start. Like, I'm pretty sure. So you I learned from yourself. <laughs> so I went back and I watched this, like, what was my That's hair great. doing? um, video of me talking about, about what to wear to a venture pitch. 
<laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is not, this doesn't keep up. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to listen to my own advice on this one. Uh, no, it's, I, but I did, I, I went through it again and I raised money for a, a company that I started with Ron Yeah, and, uh, and yeah, it, 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 a lot of the same, same things are true, you know, 10, 20 years later that were true back then. Yeah. Um, the amount of money you raise is the same. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, really, yeah. It's really, the has, same. has anything changed in the, in the, see, I've, I've never, uh, I mean, outside of, you know, this, this media company that I'm, crossing my fingers and doing all the things that I can to get it working, uh, from a content perspective, uh, you know, to do things that are important, like make money. But, um, when I look into kind of the, the world of tech entrepreneurship and creating a technology company and everything so often the outlook that I see is, well, you just, it doesn't making money doesn't matter for a very long time. It's all about increasing the amount of users and blah, blah, blah. We've heard this a million times. Is that still true? Is that as relevant or, or was it ever relevant? Is that just kind of like one of those myths that, that perpetuates throughout technology and, and entrepreneurship? It's really the core question for an entrepreneur in many ways, because I, I think that, there are many kinds of entrepreneurship and, mm -hmm. and for those who, who derive satisfaction from achieving a, a particular metric or growth or ubiquity for your product, then that user number matters, you know, and, and it matters at different levels, regardless of whether it makes you any money or not. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the older I get, the, the more important that satisfaction metric, like checking with yourself at the beginning and deciding what that is before you start really has a huge impact on your actual ability to succeed because otherwise you are often chasing the wrong goals. You know, the, the, the old, the old adage of a million users, you know, whatever, um, a lot of that mythology actually comes from the investor side of the equation where mm -hmm. the investor would say, Hey, I'll only give you money. If insert KPI here that you have to hit, you know, Reed Hoffman famous famously said million users or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. but the actual measure personally has to be what gets you up in the morning and excited and creative, right? And that could be very different. And uh, conversely, on the investor side, the actual metric is not a million users. It's have you found product market fit? And is, is there some indicator that you're going to get to an inflection point of growth? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The irony being that if you can find that company as an investor that is just about to hit it, and hasn't hit it hit it yet. You're, it's a better investment mm -hmm. than one that's already proven it and de-risked it, but no one you know wants to take risks, so they always wait to see right. like what part of that curve they're on. And, um, but I have never started with a plan to hit a metric like a million users or whatever. I've always been like, hmm. I really think this is something that should exist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's just see if we can make it exist and then we'll figure <laughs> out the rest later. Um, it's, I mean, that's, that's cre creation, right? That's like, um, yeah. it's like a writer writes a book, you know, a painter paints a painting, uh, a software developer. Well, there's different kinds. There's ones that, that need the whole thing to exist. Others that are just very excited about having made that recursion work and that function. Yeah. And that particular part. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I, it's all good. Um, I think that, that, uh, for, for me to get excited about something also, I kind of wanted it to be bigger than me one day. 
Mm -hmm. The take a life of its own sort of critical mass. I don't know what you call it. Network effect, something where it's right. like kind of rolls and you're right. like, whoa, that's, I had no idea that it was going to be that. That's really exciting for me. That's a big piece, but it, it, you know, your mileage may vary. How, how certain do you have to be about what you were just talking about in order, like how, how much, yeah. How much influence does that have over your idea? Like I, I, I know in my own perspective, from my own limited perspective, right? Doing this kind of content thing, it's really, it's next to impossible for me to envision how what I'm doing right now might become something that's bigger than mm -hmm. me because I'm so focused on the now. Yeah, it's that's a really great question because I, I I'd be lying if I said I had that much clarity on what that <laughs> yeah. might be. Like it it changes a lot. You know, if you had asked me about Scorbit, our current project when mm -hmm. we started, mm -hmm. I think I would have told you that my expectation was that it like my first goal was can we overcome this weird technical challenge of extracting game data? from a machine and getting it up to the cloud. And that's about as far as I went. Mm -hmm. And then like, once we achieved that, it was like, okay, can I, can I design something that actually makes a game more fun to play? Cause I've never been a game using developer. that data, using the data, somehow overlaying something. And the first Got time it. we ever had like our product unlock an achievement for a game that was made in like 1977, my mind oh, exploded. That's, that's amazing. You know? I mean, that's an yeah. accomplishment right there. I mean, it's like, I didn't amazing. know that was possible and now it is. And now you know, it, it is. wasn't possible it, before. Yeah. And then I, and then you look around you, like you have these moments. This is like a classic, I think, entrepreneur experience where you have this moment where something like that happens. Right. And then you look around you and you go, so did y'all, you all think that's as cool as I did. Right. And then you realize <laughs> it was very much a personal thing. Um, and then once in a while you do that and, and everyone around you goes, Oh, hell yeah. yeah. And then you're, and then you're on this train and with Scorbit, that's kind of what happened after we got to a certain point, particularly during the pandemic. Um, yeah, <laughs> our, our old that's website, exciting. I mean, we, we were just having fun and everybody suddenly yeah. wanted to connect their pinball machines to the internet during the pandemic. Go figure. Mm -hmm. You know, I still, I mean, I have ideas of where we're taking the company, obviously, because we raised money on it and we, um, you know, we hired a team and we're rebuilding our entire business, you know, but, but I like surprises. <laughs> I like discovering things that I didn't know about and opening that door and saying, you know, this product is actually really cool in this new direction that I wasn't expecting. Well, <laughs> I am, I, I am completely impressed. Like, um, I, I don't know that I've ever been this close. You know, it, Ron is, a, I would consider a very great friend of mine. We've been podcasting since 2010, I think at this point. Uh, so a very long time. We've gotten to know each other really well. And I don't know that I've ever been this close to someone who's created something so highly, like, like hardware is a really hard thing to create <laughs> yeah. and to do what you're talking about. I can only guess had a lot of technological challenges, not to mention the building of the business, but just the technological aspects of of pulling that data from these ancient Old, pinball yeah. machines. Blowing and, dust off them, yeah. And, and equating the data that's coming from old machines to the data that's coming from new machines and making it all kind of interconnected. Like it's it's been really cool from my perspective as as a friend of Ron's to kind of witness the 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 process you know the, in, in such a close way because i just i haven't had this kind of um close I mean, to a project like this before i don't think i i don't think i have either i, I mean okay <laughs> let me let me let me let me be be clear so i've started businesses that had a product that took a long time to get to market right mm -hmm. that that ended up succeeding in the end after some you know, massive war is fought, you know, whatever. But 
but I've never had one that was more of like an accident. Like mm-hmm. usually in those cases, like if you look at like Equinix, right? Like Equinix, mm-hmm. we knew that people needed data centers. We had this problem with congestion at the core of the internet. We had these sort of like long visionary goals that we wanted to set in place. And we raised, you know, a billion dollars to do it, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff. Um, but it was always a business. It was always like we could see what the product would look like and how people might consume it, you know, in, in the end. And I think that with this, what was really interesting, it was almost like an archaeological expedition hmm. where we were like, huh, oh, you know, let's meet some people from the industry that have retired, you know, or at the, you know, uh, parts of their careers where they're, where they're still involved in companies, but they're not necessarily in, you know, the person who created Defender or the person who created, you know, uh, the hardware behind, you know, vector graphics or like, you know, you meet these, these people, we would see like the, like, so when I started doing, um, uh, pinball stuff, Ron would invite me to these trade shows Hmm. And be like, hey, like, look at every video game that's ever been made and every pinball machine that's ever been made on this floor. And they would have these tracks where, like, the dude from, you know, uh, who created, I don't know, uh, you know, Robotron or whatever would, like, come and give a talk. And, of course, I would go to these talks. And one of the things you realized very quickly is that as as you were doing this archeological expedition and like uncovering different parts is that, is that these people were really, really interested in telling you how it all came together. And when you told them kind of your ideas, they would collaborate with you because they were like, Oh, that's really neat. You could take this game that I made in 1995 and add all this capability to it. Um, At one point, so we had this idea that we wanted to extract data from the displays of games and then maybe change the displays of games, you know, like to say like your player two or whatever. And we were trying to figure out how to decode it. And so um, we Googled, you know, Williams electronics display decoding or something. I don't know. We, we Googled it and we, and we find this white paper on this like very nineties style website written by a guy with photography explaining how he reverse engineered the Williams dot matrix display for this category of games and all of these processes and things. And he had his e- email address was on there, um, which was like a personal email address. So we, so I emailed the guy and I'm like, Hey Ed, his name was Ed Chung. I said, Hey Ed, we're, we're really interested in, in this, in this problem. And you wrote this white paper about it. Can you help us like do this? He goes, oh, that sounds really cool. Sure. I wrote that white paper in 2005. You sure? And I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. I know it's been a while, but like, are you willing? He's like, sure. So we're trading information back and forth and, he's, and he sends us some code. The code works. You know, it helps us kind of unblocks us. And then I finally Google him and I learn <laughs> that he's, a senior robotics scientist for NASA's ISS mission. He, <laughs> he has, he's been knighted by the Dutch royalty for his work on the Hubble space telescope. I had sort no a idea. Big deal. <laughs> that is what this has been like every corner you go, you peer around and like, there's all this wonderful knowledge and, and then suddenly you have this new way of solving a problem. Yeah. It's, yeah it's unlike anything I've ever done before. And it's so much fun. And the hardware was just a necessary evil. Like if I didn't have to do hardware, I wouldn't, but you know, we have to, um, a lot of these new manufacturers actually don't bother with the hardware. They just put our capability in their machine before they ship it. Oh, that's amazing. Right. Like that certainly simplifies things for you that they're just doing that Oh, that's really cool. That's just, that's we, a that's a real stamp of a, of approval right there. I, I you know? know. We just put it up on the internet and said, "Hey, this is open. Anyone can do it." It's Amazing. it's shocking. Uh, <laughs> it's a really different experience that we're having, and our team um, has fun every day. Yeah. Well, it's pinball. <laughs> I hope so. But but I know that's not a guarantee, right? Like there are many facets of technology that 
are on the outside looking in very enjoyable, but then, you know, the, the company culture is awful and, you know, not enjoyable at all. It's, it's business first, you know, at the expense of everything else. I mean, it does but, help that the founders, me, Ron and Brian, Brian O'Neill, uh, really weren't out to build originally anything like big and business-like we were just trying to have fun. Mm -hmm. And then years later when it was like catching on and people were buying the product and it started growing, we're like, Oh, I guess we better find a business model because, <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we kind of want to keep doing it. And the fact that now we're all paid to do it is, is just great. Um, ah, it's amazing. It is. Now we have a lot of work to do though. Like it's just starting We're we're um, our product is, is growing rapidly. Our app, which was made like Jay with Photoshop, like it's not, it's not a quality, you know, UX experience. And, and so now we have professionals on it and it's, Oh, don't know. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's, so embarrassed. it's on your website. I, I don't look, know what it's to me. tell you. It's actually me. <laughs> it's probably from my thirties or something. I don't even know what that avatar is from. Yeah. Um, the app looks a little better than that. No, no it doesn't. It still looks just as rinky dink. Well, I mean, I, you know, the, the show that I've done with Ron for more than a decade and a half at this point is about Android. We've seen thousands upon thousands of apps and I can tell you right away, like, uh, I've seen and it, like, this is actually pretty solid compared to many of the apps that, that we've experienced over the years, which well, I'm not surprised. You've, you've got Ron on, Ron on the team. He's, he scrutinizes apps. So he I'm sure does. He's, and, yeah. and to his credit, um, he's kind of kept me honest with all that. You know, we, we had a lot of volunteers helping us build this thing over the years. And then yeah. we hired a bunch of contractors, um, to help us develop the app more f quickly back in, in 2021, 2022. And a lot of them were Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. So imagine, so we have this like team, like committing code on like a weekly basis and like really engage with us every day. And then one day they're gone because like mm -hmm. all of that base, when the Ukrainian war started, they just disappeared. And so if we had a bug, there was no one to fix it. And if we had a new feature idea that was like almost ready, it was put indefinitely on hold. And, you know, at the time I wasn't really sure what to do. And Ron, you know, who all along has a, a way more experience with apps than I ever would, you know, help mm -hmm. me prioritize and say, okay, you know what? what's actually most important is that this new version of Android's coming out and it's going to break Wi-Fi. So focus on that right now. Um, and I learned to code again hmm. <laughs> in my fifties, which is kind of crazy. Um, at the time I was using YouTube classes <laughs> to teach me mm -hmm. and I'm not a greatest student at this point. I'm, very impatient. And then fortunately in the summer of 2023, AI shows up. Oh, wow. And, okay. And so I'm like, Hey, you know, we got this. So we have this feature, um, where after you've played a game, it shows you a timeline of the game, mm -hmm. like from the beginning at the end and all the modes you've unlocked and everything. And you can run your finger across it and it shows you like the timeline of like what's happening at what point during the game session. Right. So that you can particular go, game of that particular game of credits. Playing. Got it. Okay. So the idea would be like, okay, well maybe I want to look at Ron's game. He played at that tournament where he scored really high and figure out what he did to achieve yeah. that goal. There's lots of different uses for this data, but I just wanted to visualize it. And I had no ability to get Android working. Like I had iOS working, mm -hmm. but I could not and I just loaded up GitHub GoPilot. I said, what the heck? I've got nothing to lose here. I mean, I just might as see. well just ask it to unblock yeah. me. And it it was amazing. It, it helped me through, like, what was really good. It didn't really write code for me. But what it did do was it, it told me enough 
of what to do to unblock me. Mm -hmm. That makes Mm -hmm. sense. And when you say told, told you enough of what to do, is it, it's providing an example of code that it thinks solves your problem that becomes sort of kind of like a template or the skeleton of what you can then take that code and understanding now kind of how, where, where it's, now, I was going to say thinking, even though it's AI, it's not thinking, but where where it's going with that, you can then take that example and know versus staring at a blank screen and going, how do I start this from square one? Exactly. I, I see. I think I think we're in this like Goldilocks period of AI where um, it gets like 20 percent of it wrong, mm-hmm. but. But if you're good at prompting and you're like and you understand that going in, it's kind of like having a coach more than an employee. Right. I mean, now there are people who use that analogy. I hadn't heard it put that way. I like that. That's, I think that's totally accurate. And my, my daughter studies computer science and she was telling me about like how, how for her, and it's probably like that for me too. Like there's a, there's a pair programming mentor mentee kind of thing where you go to the lab And it was so novel to her because in this current world, people don't need to go to computer labs anymore for anything Mm -hmm. because they Mm -hmm. have a laptop and whatever. They all have it. (laughs) Yeah. But, um, but she would go because when she was in a group of people and she had a question, there would be this TA that could like walk up to her and, and help unblock her or stare at the problem with her and say, I don't know why that's working. Let's think about this together, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and the office was like that. If you were in a collaborative room with a bunch of other programmers and you're like, I'm really struggling with this thing. And you had this sort of collaborative world. But then since the pandemic, since we're all working from home, that serendipitous mentor is gone. Yeah. So yeah, what's interesting about AI, now AI is different for different people, but for me, it's the chat bot thing where I'm like, It's back to Pirate's Adventure. You know, I'm standing Mm -hmm. on the corner of the building and uh, I want to say the word yo-ho and be teleported something. To me, typing into that chat bot is like Pirate's Adventure. And I'm not sure what it's going to answer, but it will be collaborative in nature and then unblock me. And then sometimes it will give me code snippets that, that I look at but I think the real value for me is that I'm like, I don't really understand what you just showed me. So can you explain it? You know, that's huge. And so different people use it different ways. Some people use it for code review. Some people use it, um, uh, you know, to actually write full functions. Uh, one time I used it to comment a bunch of one of the Ukrainians code code uh co- commits that like just because it it was half completed it wasn't commented so i needed to like see what it all meant um that's kind of cool that's so, super cool but i think it unfortunately i think it is the goldilocks period because i do think that it's getting better and better and better to the point where um it kind of just does the work for you like there will i think there will come a point when the value you have as a developer becomes almost more of a curator Mm -hmm. and prompting. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's the directive from, from the companies and the people who are thinking about these tools is to make it better and better at a certain point. Does it get so good that, yeah, we end up being traffic, directors more <laughs> than we yeah. are like the, the model that you're talking about right now. It's a very educational model, right? It's an assistant or, right. or it's it a is. coach 100%. and it's, a, it's a, a tool to, um, to allow me as the user to broaden my skill set and my understanding because of it. But at a certain point, if it gets so, so big and so, uh, knowledgeable, if you can use that word, that my my input is less needed, then then my job becomes 
knowing when to direct that AI in that direction or this direction to do the things. And is that a job I really enjoy? Do I want to be the traffic director? Maybe I enjoyed the other thing. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, that's, a, that's a, that's a good, that's a good question. I, I mean, you could spend an entire podcast on sort of the moral quandary of, mm -hmm. of sort of the displacement piece. Sure. Sure. And, and I'm, I just know what I kind of enjoy when something new comes on the horizon that empowers people. Yeah. And so I love the parts of it, which amplify someone's voice or capability. You know, mm -hmm. I love technologies that do that. Um, I hate it when they, when they can be used to do the opposite. You know, it's like, I love dig, Dig was one of my favorite products I ever worked on mm -hmm. because it was it was um, encouraging conversation. It was pulling people out. It was exposing information that otherwise wasn't necessarily curated by an editor somewhere. And that was great. But then when Dig started to be more of a popularity contest, it just was the same problem all over again. Right. Mm. And, and, you know, what data is getting suppressed as a right. result of this, this trend. And, you know, it's like everyone talked about how empowering crypto was for, you know, independence and uh, sort of di distributed financing. And then of course it it's used to take advantage of people. And, and so, you know, it's a, uh, it's, it's one of the probably the, the the fun byproducts of working in the pinball industry is it's very hard for someone to corrupt <laughs> <laughs> our technology for evil. Like it's it's not I don't see it happening. True. I don't think it's gonna happen. <laughs> um <laughs> people just yeah. haven't figured it out yet, Jay. No, <laughs> it, you know, when that happens move on to the next thing. I'm out. I, I don't know. I'm out. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't want the, I don't want the, uh, the burden of that. I, yeah. I you know, okay. I understand. I, to be fair, every, every technology has its, of course, it's an application in, in one side of that or the other. Um, my daughter thinks I'm responsible for climate change because, because Equinix is like the largest data center company, you know? Like, yeah, but, mm -hmm. but I mean, what is it empowered? Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. is it created? What is it allowed for that wouldn't have been there? You know, who knows? Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. Now I live on a farm outside of Ann Arbor, like in nature. I don't, I'm, I'm a half hour from Ann Arbor and I live on a dirt road, literally next door to my childhood best friend. That's great. Um, as that sounds far delightful. away from that machine as you could possibly imagine. And I got to say, you know, um, it, you, you just sort of take you, these, these things, they come at you and you just take your swing and you get yourself into a position to either, you know, take the best advantage of it you can, or as my wife likes to say, we all just do the best job we can. And then hopefully get to kick back on the farm when we're all done. <laughs> yeah. That's, I like that, that outlook. That's solid. <laughs> that's even, it. even if I don't have a farm, you know, we're all just trying to well, do the best job we can. I'm just yeah. glad that my, my buddy thought I was okay enough after 40 years to, to move invite in next me door. to live next to him. <laughs> that sounds delightful, man. Oh, I love that. What it's a, great. We made a path between our houses. He's got a barn, you know, and, we, <laughs> and he's like teaching me how to use a tractor. And uh, oh, how awesome. It's kind of how great. enjoyable. Uh, before I let you go, do you have a room with a bunch of pinball machines or? You know, I, I do have. So I, I just. I need to explain when I lived in California. So I grew up in Michigan and then I moved yep. to California um, when I graduated from college. And when I lived in California, I had uh, a, a garage 
that was filled with pinball machines, both mine and other people's pinball machines that we would like do research on and all this, right? Well, when I moved here, we hadn't actually seen the house that we bought. Mm-hmm. And it was like one eighth the size of the house we moved out of. Hmm. So there are pinball machines in my bedroom, in the living room, in the laundry room, <laughs> like in the hallway, right? And my wife has said, Brenda, she, was, she said to me, if I don't get them out, then I will be out. <laughs> I'm so, sick of sharing space with these pinball machines in every room. So the plan is to have an office space with a bunch of pinball machines in it. Love it. And I'm supposed to execute on that now. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm in ASAP. Trouble. ASAP. Build a barn. You know, yeah. build build a pinball barn, the the pin barn, whatever that you is, call it. That is the thing. People build yeah. these pole barns here and fill them with pinball machines, and it's like a thing in Michigan. Love it. it. Isn't that great? <laughs> I think that's I think that's the blueprint for what you need to do, in my opinion. For sure. <laughs> Jay, it's been an absolute uh, joy getting the chance to talk to you for an hour to finally meet you after all this time, uh, hearing about you through Ron. And of course, I you know I was a huge fan of Revision Three and everything you guys were doing back oh, in the thanks. day. Worked with a worked with a lot of the folks there when I was at CNET and Twit. So very familiar with all of your work, and uh, yeah, you're just a lot of fun to hang out with. Thank you so much for coming on today and talking to me about nice. everything that you've done. Yeah, anytime, man. And if you ever want me back, just <laughs> just wave. I've got I've got uh, nothing but respect for the stuff you're doing here. This is this is thank you. This is great. This is great. Really yeah. enjoyed it. Thank you, Jay. All the best. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Huge thank you to my guest, Jay Adelson. Uh, It was just such a pleasure. (laughs) So like, I love the shows, the episodes that dive deep into the nostalgia quality. And uh, my conversation with Jay really brought me there. So Jay, thank you for your time. Uh, and thank you at home or wherever you happen to be for watching and listening. All things Texploder can be found at Texploder.com. And, you know, you can just go there. You can subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss a single episode. Uh, you can also catch it on the YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash at Texploder. Texploder patrons get exclusive access to things. So if you want to support us on on Patreon, you can do that. Uh, the live pre-recordings, you get access to that. You get some pre-show hangouts uh, when we're holding those, some ad-free shows, early access to my YouTube videos, Discord community. There's a whole bunch of stuff wrapped up in the Patreon. We also offer the chance to be an executive producer of the show. Not only do you get that label, you also get a Texploder t-shirt. Just like this week's executive producers, Bill Rudder, Jeffrey Maricini, John Cuny, Taylor Sunderhaus, and WPVM 103.7 in Asheville, North Carolina. That's patreon.com slash Jason Howell. Huge thank you to my patrons. And thanks to our guest, Jay Adelson, once again. Thanks to you for watching and listening. I'm Jason Howell. I'll see you next time on another episode of the Texploder Podcast. Bye, everybody. Bye.